mode. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's webinar, Getting Ready for Winter. My name is Shane Gebauer. I'm with Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. I'd like to welcome you all here this evening. Um, as the title implies, we'll be talking about getting ready for winter. So the question that we need to start off with uh, right from the top is why? Why are we talking about winter when we are in the middle to late July? Uh, much of the United States, uh, if you're in the United States, uh, is experiencing rather high temperatures. We are certainly here in North Carolina with temperatures exceeding 90. Uh, why are we thinking about snow and the cold and et cetera when we're in the middle of summer? Well, hopefully as we progress through this evening, we will um, answer that question and you'll understand why it is that we're discussing this uh, tonight because it is important I think that we consider winter at this time of year and again hopefully you'll see that by the conclusion of this evening's webinar. So again welcome let's get uh, into the the topic of what does it take to uh, get ready for winter? Well first off we need to start early. Um, there's a lot of things we need to consider and so that's why we're discussing it now. We need to start early, and I'll talk more about this as we progress through when we talk about dealing with disease, when we deal about talk about nutrition, etc. Um, we have to have a healthy hive, right? If you consider that honeybees during this time of year are living four to six weeks because of the rigors of, of foraging and such, those bees that are typically living four to six weeks, during the winter time we want to live four, five, maybe six months. Now, of course, they don't have the rigors of foraging on them, but still, that's a tremendous difference going from a lifespan of four to six weeks versus four to six months. And so we've got to be healthy in order, for, or the bees need to be healthy in order for that to take place, in order for them to make it that long through the, the stressors of winter. We need to have ample food reserves. So, of course, these bees are not hibernating. They're not going dormant. It's not like they uh, fatten themselves up like a, uh, a bear would and, and then sleeps all winter long. We are beekeepers. We know that. They're active, and they're vibrating their wing muscles to generate heat. To do that, they need lots of food good food, healthy food, a good diverse diet. They need to be healthy and well fed going into winter. So we need to make sure that there's adequate food reserves inside that, uh, inside that colony. We've got to deal with moisture. So a lot of times I'll hear from beekeepers that, oh, the cold killed my hive. Well, bees are very good at dealing with cold. They're quite capable of dealing with exceptionally cold temperatures. It's when we combine those temperatures with, uh, with moisture that we begin to have problems, real problems. Um, and so we've got to make sure that we're dealing with that moisture. It's just like us, right? If you think about uh, a day that maybe is 40 degrees and rainy and you go outside, that moisture wicks the heat away from our body. So it feels, what do we say, you know, it's chilled to the bone, it's raw outside, whatever phrase you want to use, versus a day that's maybe 20 degrees and sun shining uh, and the air is dry, I would take that 20 degree day over the 40 degree day simply because that moisture isn't wicking the heat away from my body and I'm more capable of keeping myself warm. It's the same thing inside the beehive that with the moisture uh, wicks that uh, heat away from the bees. So we've got to deal with the, the moisture. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's first off start uh, with the first bullet point of why starting early. So this is sort of a, a graph of a, a colony's population over the course of a, uh, a typical season. Now, it varies a little bit. Some graphs will show just simply a, uh, one peak in the summertime. Here, there's a slight dip in July with a little boost in, in August. This might be a typical uh, hive in the area where I am because right now, sourwood is done. There's nothing for those bees to eat. Uh, except for what they may have in the colony. So they may slow, the queen may slow egg laying, and therefore the colony decrease in number a little bit. But then we do generally get a little bit of an aster or goldenrod 
flow uh, that's just uh, on the verge of beginning. I've seen some very early uh, goldenrod out there, so the population may come up a little bit. Well, if we keep this in context and we also superimpose the mite population onto uh, the population of the bees, we can see that the, the, uh, the mite population trails a little bit behind the bees. And so if we wait until the mite population is, is, is at its absolute maximum, it's basically too late at that point because these mites are vectoring viruses. And, and you may have heard me give this analogy before where uh, if, if you're being bitten by a mosquito that's vectoring West Nile virus, it's transmitting West Nile virus, you may swat the mosquito and kill that mosquito, but that doesn't mean that you're healthy at that point. In fact, quite the contrary. What that means or potentially means is that you may exhibit symptoms, West Nile virus symptoms, for 21 days after your initial infection. And it's the same thing with these bees and these, these viruses inside the colony in that these mites are parasitizing the bees, they're vectoring these viruses, and the viruses persist after those mites are gone. And so let's think about this for a second. If we wait until the mites are at their absolute, absolute maximum, which in this graph suggests late August, early September, that's also when the potential for vectoring these viruses is at their absolute maximum. And so if we wait until that point, we're only delaying that sort of natural purging process, that natural cleansing process of, in which the virus levels decrease over time. And, and so if we look at the strength of colonies and how they're capable of dealing with, um, with Varroa, we can see if sh we have strong colonies, they're better capable of dealing with the virus loads than weak colonies. So it's important to maintain good strong colonies, but also deal with those um, deal with those Varroa levels and thus the virus levels. And Varroa, in case you're wondering, it's global. It's everywhere. I also hear from people that are fairly new into beekeeping. I don't have any. Well, that's that's probably not true. That you've got them and they are present and you just aren't seeing them. And so these Varroa are reproducing under the caps uh, uh, with the, the maturing bee. And if we look at drones, because the mites gravitate towards those drones that we'll see for every one mite about 27 in 30 days for every one mite we'll see about eight if it's if it's going into a worker cell so we can use this to our advantage but I'd like to, to just discuss the timing a little bit more now knowing sort of the reproduction now knowing the viruses a little bit and think about the timing so it takes about uh, 21 days from the time an egg is laid until the time that egg, if it's a worker, emerges as an adult worker bee inside the colony. And so if we, if we have high varroa levels now, that means those varroa levels are parasitizing the adult bees and also entering into the cells uh, of the bees that are about ready to be sealed over and pupate into adult bees. So what does this mean? Let's think about this now from a health standpoint of the individual bee. First off, you've got adult bees that are being parasitized by these Varroa. These adult bees are, are infected with these viruses. These viruses are weakening that bee. And, and now that adult bee is also tasked with the responsibility of feeding the developing larva that will soon be capped over. So we've got a sick bee infected with viruses feeding the next generation of uh, bee that is now going to be infected with viruses because there's that sort of um, transmission from uh, one generation to the next of these viruses within the hive. So we've got the larva being infected with, with the viruses. Now that larva uh, develops, it gets capped over. Now that larva is pupating into adult bee and it, it too is now being parasitized inside the cell by some of these mites that are reproducing with it. So again, the virus levels 
are, are increasing as a result of that. So we've got a B that was fed by a weak, sick B that's now only getting sicker because it's being parasitized by these viruses. It emerges, or parasitized by the varroa that are vectoring the viruses. It emerges out from the cell. So now we've got sort of this, this second generation of B that's got a double whammy because it was fed by a sick bee, and now it's been parasitized while it's developing, and now that bee we're expecting to feed the next generation. So you can see the importance of making sure our varroa levels never get too high. So if we cut the mites out of the system right now, we still have um, those adult bees that are sick and infested with the infected with the viruses. They are still going to feed the next generation of bee. Now that next generation of bee is going to pupate. Fortunately, now we've treated, so we don't necessarily have the high varroa levels, but we still have that second bee, second generation pupating with high virus levels because it was fed by the sick bee. So it's going to come out. It is not getting the double whammy because we treated for mites, but it's still got the virus loads. And now it is not being parasitized as an adult, so those virus loads don't necessarily increase uh, as they would if we hadn't treated, but it's still feeding the next generation and still transmitting some of those viruses. So you can see now those viruses are still persisting but decreasing with each generation. And so if we take a timeline, and let's just say it's the end of July, it's pretty close, we've got 21 days of that bee that's uh, being fed, the larva that's being fed by the adult bee that was parasitized by the, the varroa and is sick. 21 days. So now we're mid late August before that generation of bee emerges that's still infested with with vir or viruses feeding the next generation which will also have some viruses but not as much because we've treated for varroa and that generation emerges out in say mid September it raises the next generation that will emerge out into late or I'm sorry uh, early to mid October now at that point, we've got a bee that's relatively healthy, which is great because now that bee in mid-October is possibly one of the early winter bees, possibly one of the bees that we're hoping to go through um, winter. Now if we had not treated now at the end of July but rather waited until early September and we follow that same timeline we've got 21 days uh, of a larva being de uh, fed, uh, developing that was fed by a very sickly bee so that puts us to uh, latish September it's going to feed the next generation which will come out in mid to late October that's better but still sick it's the next generation that's going to be relatively healthy that's coming out in mid to late november now we're getting into bees that are are um, some winter bees that are raised out in october that are still sickly and now we're in november which isn't bad but it's not the population the healthy population we don't have the numbers that we need to survive the winter so you can now hopefully see why it's important that we treat earlier rather than later. And so how do you know if your hive is healthy? How do you know if you need to treat? Well, so the reality is that when I first started uh, in beekeeping about 12 years ago, it was always preached and taught that you don't treat unless you have to. Right? You don't, you don't want to uh, stress that colony with some treatment unless you absolutely need to. Because regardless of what treatment you use, whether it's uh, an organic acid, uh, a soft chemical, um, or a hard chemical, these treatments have some level of stress, uh, they induce some level of stress on the colony. So the prevailing thought was don't do it unless you have to. Nowadays, the prevailing thought is pretty much if you have the opportunity 
you should take it and you should treat. So, um, but you still, despite the fact that we're just sort of treating almost as a matter of course, you should still know what your levels are because yes, we can, if, if we are going to treat, uh, but our levels are relatively low, maybe we can wait for uh, another week perhaps until this hot spell breaks and get it more favorable uh, window, uh, weather window to treat if we're using soft chemicals. But if the colony number or the mite levels are exceptionally high, uh, we might a week might make a difference. And so we've got to take some action today. So we need to know our levels and we certainly need to know what's happening to them over time. So if I had levels that I was slightly concerned about two weeks ago and I check again today and those levels are the same, that's a different picture than if I had those uh, levels that I was concerned about two weeks ago and I check again today and those levels have doubled versus staying the same. It's a very different picture depending on what's happening over time. So it's important to know what's going on inside your hive uh, over time and knowing what these, these mite populations are doing. So, uh, impacts of the varroa slash viruses, so you get uh, a lower body mass, the uh, immune response is compromised, you get a shorter life expectancy, which is very bad when we talk about winter bees, so it's important again to keep these levels low, to keep viruses low, uh, so if, if you can do something just to knock the population of varroa down, to prevent it from hitting that maximum, that exponential growth curve, that will be to your advantage. You may not have 95% efficacy, but if you could do something that got 20% of the mites, that will have a profound impact on the growth curve of that mite population, thus the viruses. And by the way, I should mention, this goes back to the previous slide, that uh, it, how do you know what's a bad mite level? Well, the reality, is now about three mites um, is on a on a sticky board like I was showing on that previous slide is is a reason to treat just three mites. Um, there our knowledge and understanding of just how uh, much they impact the health of the colony is really coming to light now. So this gets at um, the point that I was trying to make before with the the horizontal transmission versus the vertical transmission where it's going from generation to generation but it's also going from adult B to adult B and so that perpetuates the longevity of the viruses inside the hive and, and thus accounts for sort of that latency from the time we de uh, treat for the varroa until those virus levels decrease. And so we have to make sure we do this and some of the modeling, I just mentioned three mites um, is, is a reason to treat. There's modeling that suggests eight mites per 300 bees can lead to a viral epidemic that, that crashes a colony. And so we want to make sure we have our threshold lower than that, significantly lower than that, and this lends credence to that three mite rule. If we look at other things that impact the health of the colony, and our ability to overwinter, it's, it's pesticides, right? These are some of the things we're hearing about now is causing issues with mortality of the bees. So it's no uh, coincidence that we're discussing these as we're getting ready for winter. So pesticides are coming back to the hive and it's not necessarily the, um, the individual pesticides that are causing the problems, but the synergistic interaction between all the pesticides. So that's all this graph is showing. I don't want to go into it in too much detail, but uh, suffice it to say there are two things on here that are basically like drinking water, but in combination they are a lethal cocktail. And so we've got to deal with these external factors. And so one of the ways to do this is comb rotation. And so the reason why I'm talking about comb rotation is because I am actually uh, trying, I try this time of year to prepare for next spring. And so winter is very much on my mind as I'm going through my colonies. So if we look at the diagrams that I've got here, the little illustrations, 
you can see on the left side, we've got a spring summer sort of configuration. In this case, I'm using all medium boxes and it's illustrated as eight frames per box. They're eight frame mediums. And this is one of the reasons why I like all medium boxes. So as I'm going through my hives this time of year, I'm identifying comb which I want to replace, either the ones that are the oldest or perhaps the, it may be a relatively new frame, but perhaps it just has a whole lot of drone comb on it. And as you may recall from a few slides ago, drone comb produces more mites. So if I can reduce the amount of drone comb in my hive, I can also reduce the opportunity, the area for these mites to reproduce. So maybe these frames, some of these frames have a lot of drone comb. Maybe I was delinquent last winter and a mouse got in there and chewed some of them up and so I want to call those, whatever the reason may be. But typically I'm trying to get the older frames and that's illustrated by the gray boxes. Those are frames that are, I, I've identified as ones to replace. The, the box that's sort of separated, that's got the orange bars, that's my honey super. And I use a queen excluder. This is just my personal preference. I use a queen excluder so I i don't have the bees storing the pollen in my honey supers. And that's important because a lot of the contaminants that are coming back to the colony are coming back to the colony with the pollen. So if I keep that pollen down in the brood chamber, I keep my honey frames fairly clean. So as I'm going through the hive, I've identified these frames I want to replace and I'm slowly trying to work them down lowest in the hive and to the outside. I want to get them as low as possible because generally in springtime, the bees are in the top box because they follow the heat and they're generally in the center. And so if I can get the frames to the outside and to the bottom, I can then in spring easily pull the frames that I've identified and now that's not honey I'm putting back in there, but the col they're colored to illustrate that they've come from my honey super. And I can replace those frames with frames from my honey super. And the advantage here is that these frames are already drawn out. They may just need a little bit of repair, but these bees can start utilizing them immediately. The queen can start laying. They can start storing nectar and pollen, etc., in them without compromising resources without them having to invest resources to build that comb. That's an advantage in early spring because we don't want to do anything to slow the rebound of this colony after it's come through winter. We don't want to slow the growth of the colonies uh, trying to, to come back, uh, increase its numbers after winter. Now, yes, I've taken frames from my honey super, but if I'm doing a good job, this colony will grow and thrive and and be in a much better position to draw out comb in my honey super because it will be a larger, stronger colony at that point and it won't sacrifice much uh, in honey production. So this is a very nice way to have comb rotation to try and get rid of some of those external contaminants that are coming back into the hive. So. Um, the other thing that we can do, we can look at uh, some IPM techniques to try and help the overall health of the hive. So screen bottom boards, drone trapping, powdered sugar, etc. cetera. Um, the, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about drone trapping. Um, this is a great way to deal with um, mites. It's also a way to, uh, to get rid of uh, some old wax. If you want to uh, call frames, you can put some frames without foundation, which was shown here. They'll draw all uh, drone comb. You can remove that. Uh, in this case, it's a green frame that is drone-sized cells that they, uh, the queen will lay a drone egg in. You wait until that frame is um, capped, and then you remove it, wait, freeze it 48 hours, and um, those drone and the mites are killed in it. Um, now, if you want to restore it back, return it back to the colony, just make sure it's thawed. It's good to have two, so you pull one out. You can put the uh, other one in once, and they'll clean it out. They'll cannibalize the brood. They'll kill, clean out all those uh, varroa, except, dead varroa, etc. Another great way is, uh, and this also helps with both the varroa and the comb contamination, uh, issue is if you make splits, um, the reason why this helps is it interrupts the, the reproduction cycle of a colony. Um, 
because you're in this case in the lower left having to install a new queen you also uh, can in this uh, you can see in this case there are three frames that were used to make the split and then there are all the other frames that have been put in there the other seven frames that are brand new that they will draw brand new comb out on so you're get uh, you're bringing new wax they will be bringing new wax into this system you'll presumably the three frames that came from the parent hive you had to put frames in in the place there so you could have put new frames uh, in the place of these three that we see in this box here as well again a way to sort of call and rotate uh, uh, frames and foundation and wax to get rid of eventually get rid of the oldest and get new in there we have medications, soft chemicals, uh, Apple IFR, Mighty Way Quick Strip, and now we've got oxalic acid, which uh, we are in the process of registering in all the uh, states. We've got 22 states registered now. The others, uh, we've, we've got um, most of the others, uh, the applications submitted. We're waiting to hear back. There's only a handful of states that we're still working on uh, getting the application in so oxalic acid is an approved if you're uh, if it's labeled for use uh, if it's labeled for use in a beehive you can use it inside the beehive the problem is that a lot of people are going and buying it and it's not officially labeled by the EPA to be used in in honeybee colonies if it doesn't have the EPA label on it it is uh, not a legal application. This is important because some of the other, some of the oxalic acid on the market has other ingredients, the so-called other ingredients in it, and uh, those can introduce contaminants into the hive. So it's important to use product that's only, uh, or rather, product that's labeled with the EPA uh, approved label, and therefore you know you're getting product that is appropriate for use inside a beehive. There's two ways of doing it, the trickle method which uses the syringe on the left or the vapor method where you put a gram on the little uh, aluminum heat plate there and it vaporizes uh, the, the oxalic acid and fumigates the hive. Oxalic acid is an organic acid that naturally occurs in honey so you're not introducing anything that's not already there. So the other thing that we can do is just generally reduce stress. Now, when I again going back to when I first started in the industry, uh, the product Honey Bee Healthy was fairly new to the market, and I honestly thought it was more to make the beekeeper feel good about what they were doing for their bees than than to actually help the bees themselves. Um, I have come complete full circle on that. Um, it, there is some very good, numerous anecdotal. Uh, evidence to support the, its benefit for overall hive health as well as some good scientific research to support hive health. Um, and so as a matter of practice I always use Honey Bee Healthy uh, when feeding bees. There's some other products that are also very good. They're just not as uh, they haven't been on the market as long as Honey Bee Healthy, such as Hive Alive, which uses uh, seaweed ex extract as well as some essential oils. That also is uh, there's some great research to show that it helps with um, uh, overall hive health. The research suggests it reduces nosema uh, spore counts, which is great. So these things have benefit to reduce stress. They also have some benefit to uh, help the hive. The, the health of the hive, but these products don't make claims that they are treatments in any way. The reason being is they would then have to register them as a treatment with the EPA, and that's a very expensive uh, ordeal, and so they don't go through that uh, process. So they just market them as um, feeding stimulants, uh, it's sort of like a multivitamin type of, of situation. So these products are very beneficial as well. Which leads to the feeding. So nutrition. There was a, a great study that came out uh, a couple of months ago that looked at uh, nutrition inside a colony. And much like uh, the scenario that we laid out earlier, how a sick bee feeding a, uh, the next generation has impact on that next generation's health, 
nutrition inside a colony trickles down from generation to generation in much the same way. Um, if you have a bee that is malnourished as a larva and it develops into an adult bee, studies are showing that that bee is not, even if the nutrition uh, uh, situation alleviates itself when that, uh, that bee is an adult, if it was raised as, under malnourishing situation, circumstances, even as adult, if those, if those circumstances have changed, it still produces an inferior food that is being fed to the next generation of bees. So again, these, these studies are showing that nutrition trickles down generation to generation. So it's not just sort of a short-term problem. It's, it may be short-term in terms of what is coming to the colony, but if there's a dearth or a, a, a monoculture of pollen type, it, that will have a lasting impact for several, uh, potentially several months, even if that, that situation alleviates itself. So it's important to understand what's going, in, going on inside our colony. Uh, and again, since this trickles down from generation to generation, that's why it's important now, especially since this time of year, there's often at least a slowing of nectar and pollen sources, if not outright dearths. Uh, for example, in our area, sourwood is done. Uh, that's sort of the last thing that blooms in uh, part of sort of early to late spring, early summer. Um, and now we've got nothing. There's very, very little going on in our area right now. And so we are in a dearth. This is when robbing usually happens because pe the bees are frantically looking for resources. So if we're not attentive to our colonies during these, these times of dearth or malnourishment, it will last into early, late fall, early winter and potentially impact the survival of the colony through winter. So we've got to make sure that there's uh, both carbohydrates, which would be honey or sugar syrup or corn syrup, something along those lines, uh, uh, adequate carbohydrate sources and protein sources. So protein would be the pollen. So you can look for frames uh, as you're inspecting your hive to see if they've got adequate pollen reserves. Uh, that pollen's necessary for feeding the generation of bees to come. So if you see uh, a, a shortage of pollen, feed a protein patty like we've got there in the upper left corner. If you see uh, a, uh, a nice array, nice color spectrum of pollen in the frames and a good amount, then it's okay. We're doing all right. There's, there's a good diverse diet for them to utilize to make that food to feed the, the future generations. If you're going through your hive and you're inspecting frames of, of stored carbohydrates, so honey or sugar syrup, and you see today that it's about half full and you come back next week and it's full, great. That means that they're still finding uh, reserves out in nature and they're, they're putting up a surplus. If you come back next week and it's that frame that was half full is now empty, that means they're consuming and thus you need to uh, consider feeding. And again, I picture the honeybee healthy because that's something that I think is, is a very valued resource when uh, feeding. It also helps preserve uh, and increase the shelf life of the, uh, the syrups that you're using. The last thing that we need to talk about is moisture control. So um, if, if you see something uh, like this, um, this is uh, bees that are slightly molded. You can see uh, the mold there on some of them, which suggests that there was a high degree of moisture. The other thing that we see here are a lot of bee butts sticking out of the cells, which is classic starvation. Um, so this is a sign of both high moisture because of, of the mold that's growing in there as well as uh, starvation. Now I'll just point out here for a second that um, I, again I hear a lot of times that oh yeah they, they were all head first inside the cells but you know no it wasn't starvation there was honey just, just a half an inch away. They had plenty of honey and it was right next to them so it wasn't starvation. 
Well, if you see this, even if there's honey just a half an inch away, this is still, uh, all these bee butts is still a sign of starvation. What probably happened in the scenario with the honey very close by was that the bees lost thermal mass. In other words, the cluster got so small that um, they could no longer sustain the temperature and that would allow them to move to that honey that's just a half an inch away. So uh, they, they starved because they didn't have enough bees. And perhaps they didn't have enough bees because they were sick and they dropped out, they died uh, very early on in winter. And so again, I often hear from, from people that some of the strongest hives going into winter are the ones that don't make it. Largely because I think that these strong colonies, which have very large numbers of bees, also have very large numbers of mites, and therefore very large virus levels, very high virus levels, and thus they may seemingly be the healthiest based on number. They may be the sickest because of that number, because of the viruses and, and the varroa and the viruses associated with a large population. And so we often see those clusters shrink rather rapidly as the stressors of winter uh, descend upon the colony. The other thing that I'll mention uh, going back to, to Varroa is that if you have uh, bees that sort of disappear in the middle of winter, I hear that more and more now where, yeah, I was out there a couple of weeks ago in, in January and on a warm day, they were there. I inspected at the end of January and they were completely gone. Well, bees aren't really going to abscond uh, that time of year uh, unless there's something wrong. And what we believe uh, to be causing that sort of absconding behavior at times, like in the middle of winter when it makes no sense whatsoever, we believe it to be viruses, high virus levels that are causing that, that type of behavior. Um, so that's a sign of high virus loads in your colony. So let's get back to moisture. So we've got the, the mold here. We've got to deal with moisture. So one of the things um, uh, that, that we have to sort of shake uh, from, from our conception of what's happening, uh, our perception of what's happening inside the, um, the hive is that we think of the inside of a hive like we think of the inside of our homes. We personally do not heat our homes with our bodies. We use external forces to maintain the temperature inside the hive. The bees, on the other hand, are using their bodies to heat, not the inside of the hive. Their only goal is to maintain their temperature. And so here's an illustration um, that was uh, redrawn from uh, some work by Seely, you can see this is a three-storied hive with uh, sort of this, this illustration of temperature zones. So you can see that dark blob in the center top box, that's the brood area. Then you've got a loose core, the cluster perimeter, and you can see the temperatures as we move out, right? So in that red area, we're looking at about 91 degrees Fahrenheit, 33 degrees Celsius. And as we move out, we get uh, 24 degrees Celsius, about 75. And it's really just that top box, just the cluster, right? Because you can see that purple line is the cluster perimeter. And it goes from 24 degrees C, about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and it drops right down to 59 degrees. And in that bottom box, with an ambient outside temperature of 12 degrees Fahrenheit, that bottom box is about 19 degrees. So that's a huge temperature differentiation between where the cluster is, where the brood nest is, and inside the lower portions of that hive. So this sort of illustrates the point that the bees are not trying to maintain the temperature inside the hive. Rather, they're just trying to maintain the temperatures of themselves. So what we have to do then is shake that notion that if we ventilate the hive, we're somehow stealing all their hot air. Because again, once you get away from the cluster, the temperature drops 
quite dramatically. Uh, and so they're just focused on themselves, not the surrounding area. So again, vent that hive, get rid of the moisture, because what's happening here is if that cluster were down just a little bit lower, uh, they would be producing all this moisture because they're in there breathing. That moisture is going to follow the warm air up. It's going to hit the under the cold underside of an inner cover, and it's going to condense. And if we're lucky, it'll freeze there. If we're unlucky, it'll just sort of condense and start dripping right away. But even if it freezes, what will happen is you'll get a day where it gets above freezing. That moisture will thaw and it will rain down on the bees. And we've got that scenario, that analogy that I gave earlier, where it's 20 degrees and sunny outside versus 40 degrees and wet outside. Which day would you rather have? Well, if it, that moisture is dripping down on the bees, we're putting them into that 40 degree rainy day, or worse, it's, it's that day where it's uh, 45 degrees, uh, or 19 degrees rather, or 12 degrees and moisture is dripping down because it's sort of melting from the heat of the, the brood uh, area. And so um, we've got to make sure we get rid of that, that moisture. And so how do we do it? There's lots of different ways. So first off in this, the background, this newspaper, this is, I, I snagged that from a Bee and Forum's website where they just took a, a rim, that's an inner cover with a rim around it, they crumple up newspaper, threw it in there, and, and newspaper is very good at absorbing moisture. You can also see people use sawdust or wood chips uh, to help. You can also get uh, devices like a wintering inner cover that has this uh, homosote, which helps with the moisture. Uh, also this, which is uh, called a Vivaldi board, where you can put burlap inside. There, you can't see it, but underneath the burlap is a uh, an opening that allows the moisture to come up. And this burlap will actually absorb that moisture and prevent it from getting back down into the colony. So we've got some great pictures of the, the, the burlap actually soaking wet from the moisture, but because of the way the board's designed, it can't go back down into the colony and drip down onto the bees. So you've got to ventilate or somehow trap the moisture inside the colony so that it doesn't drip back down onto the bees. So if you can do that, if you can, if you can, um, one, make sure that you've got, uh, uh, you start early and you need to start early because you've got to deal with your varroa, thus, and, and uh, associated with the varroa, your virus levels. You've got to make sure you've got a healthy hive. An important component of that is nutrition, as well as uh, contaminants, working to reduce the contaminants inside the hive. And last, once you actually, so that's in advance of winter. And then once you actually get into the winter months, you've got to uh, deal with the moisture problem inside that colony. If you can do those things, you will increase your uh, survival rate uh, considerably. And it's much easier than it sounds, but um, it's a very important, most important that you start early. Um, okay, so let's uh, turn to our question panel uh, that I've got. If you've got, uh, if you've got some questions, um, there is a, uh, a panel that should be in your upper right corner of your screen that you can type in some questions and I'll scan through them and uh, do my best to get as many as possible. Uh, let's see here. What's the easiest way to know uh, your um, your Varroa levels? And and there's another question here that's that I'll touch on as part of um, that question, which is how effective is powdered sugar shaken over the top of the hive? So the reason why I'm coupling those is because if we think about a sugar shake, which um, is is probably one of the easiest ways to do uh, a, a Varroa count, and and what you do is you take a uh, a mason jar, and if you're familiar with mason jars, you've got the band and you've got the lid that forms sort of the cap, if you will, of the mason jar, if you're a canner. Well, what you want to do is replace that lid 
with uh, number eight hardware cloth. Um, and, and what you do is you put some, uh, some powdered sugar in that mason jar. You put about 300 bees inside that mason jar. Um, and you put the, the, the band with that hardware cloth lid on the top. And by the way, 300 bees is about a half a cup of, of bees. You want to scoop them up off your brood frames. Um, and then you're going to fairly vigorously slosh them around, the bees in, around with the powdered sugar. And what happens is that powdered sugar plugs the, uh, the little feet of the varroa mite and they start to drop off the, the bees. You then invert the jar and use it like a sugar shaker. The mites and the powdered sugar come through the hardware cloth. The bees do not. So you want to shake that sugar and mite uh, mixture onto a flat surface that you can sort of paw through to find all those sort of reddish brown mites in and amongst the white powdered sugar. And you count uh, the mites that way. So that's the easiest way to, to quickly assess your varroa levels um, and that to, to get to the point of how effective is powdered sugar shaken over the top. We know powdered sugar dislodges the mites because it works in a sugar shaker uh, in, in doing a, a varroa count that way. So why wouldn't it work on the colony level? And it does. The issue is that... Um, it, it's only going to get the mites that we refer to as phoretic mites. These are the mites which are on the adult bees. The majority, the vast majority of the mites inside the hive are not on the adult bees. Rather, they're inside the capped cells. So powdered sugar won't touch those unless you do repeated treatments. So to be effective, to, uh, you've got to use powdered sugar um, several times during the course of the season, usually every couple of weeks to keep that virus load down, or I'm sorry, varroa level down and prevent it from growing. The, the other thing is that um, it's not going, even though you may get some powdered sugar on a bee, it may not necessarily dislodge the mite. I More specifically to, to your question about how the efficacy I have not seen any good data to say if you did this, um, you know, X number of treatments over the course of a month, you would get 95% efficacy. I've, I haven't seen those sorts of data. Uh, I know there are some researchers working on that, though. Um, what position should the drone comb frame be? So in those, in that slide, I'll go back up. If I can, uh, I'll go back up to that. I had it in the, uh, whoops, this is, uh, this is my hive, one, two, three, fourth position in a 10 frame box. Um, I, I would probably uh, not go much, I would not go uh, that far in. This, this was our first attempt at uh, doing this. Uh, I would probably keep it on in moral, probably most likely the third spot maybe the second spot, depending on what the size of the brood nest uh, looked like. Um, so let's see, what do I think of Apigard? Apigard is a thymol-based product similar to the Apolife VAR. Um, I have uh, had people express concern um, that the, the carrier um, gel I don't know how else to refer to it, um, may impart some contaminants in the hive. I don't know if that's true. I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen any data, but that is a concern with, uh, with Apigard. Um, otherwise, it's a, it's a soft chemical. I know a lot of people use it. Uh, personally, um, I gravitate towards the Apolife VAR. Um, how much pollen is necessary? It all depends on the time of year and what's happening inside the colony. If they're raising a lot of brood, they will need a lot of pollen because they need that protein for the developing larva. Um, and so you should see that rainbow pattern inside the frame. So you would see sort of the brood uh, 
door, down near the lower edge of the frame forming sort of a half circle then you would see uh, a band of about an inch or so half an inch or so of pollen and then in the corners you would see the honey that's a very good frame that's what we would be looking for if I don't see a lot of pollen I'm concerned they will begin to uh, either reduce the brood production or we're going to have a situation of malnourishment so you've got to just sort of watch to see what's happening to the the pollen uh, stores are they growing or are they decreasing if it's if, if it's during the growing season where the bees should be reproducing and I'm seeing a decreasing amount of pollen I'm concerned uh, let's see with regard to moisture in winter is it best to have a solid bottom board or a screen bottom board personally I like a screen bottom board and my understanding is that the screen bottom board was originally uh, came on the scene not to deal with uh, Varroa but rather to help with moisture um, so that if by chance it did sort of rain down inside the hive at least it leaves the hive and doesn't collect down there on the on a solid bottom board where it can stay with inside the colony so the screen bottom board helps with that it also helps a little bit with the ventilation to help exhaust um, that uh, moisture because you get sort of the convection currents going through that colony the bees are generating heat which force which causes that air to rise well if the air is rising it's got to create some sort of vacuum to replace the air that's moving up and so it can do that uh, with a screen bottom board it could also do that with through the entrance but the screen bottom board helps with that a little bit so uh, personally I like screen bottom boards however I do know of a lot of people that are have gone back to solid bottom boards in areas where there's hive beetle uh, despite the the moisture problems because the high beetle uh, it, it, it can't get through that screen and sort of hide from the bees they're on if it's a solid bottom board the beetles are on that bottom board and then the bees can chase them around and quarantine them let's see uh, should a hive be insulated during winter so this is referring to uh, sort of the hive wrap wrapping your hives um, I know a lot of people wrap their colonies um, it, it's not so common obviously in the south where winters aren't quite so harsh um, but it's more common up north uh, I used to live in the foothills of the Adirondacks where it got sub-zero on a regular basis it didn't last very long but we had those chilly nights in and, and I, I didn't bother wrapping my hives I think moisture is more of a concern than um, trying to retain that heat um, certainly it does help the bees keep themselves warm if we don't have you know a gale force winds going through the colony which wouldn't happen based on the aerodynamics but if the heats retained a little bit it makes it a little bit easier for them to heat themselves but uh, in my opinion moisture is more of a problem than trying to retain that heat I can tell you that there are definitely people that would disagree with me on that and so uh, if you're in one of those northern areas perhaps you should try it try wrapping it a lot of people use just simply the black tar paper that you can pick up at any hardware store that it's relatively cheap for a lot of linear footage uh, if you take care of it it'll probably get you several winters out of one roll you can even reuse it um, and so you can try to uh, to wrap some colonies and see whether it changes your survival rate or not what is the name of the board uh, with the burlap for moisture control so this um, is called a Vivaldi board um, we are just now starting to carry them in North Carolina and Pennsylvania uh, this actually uh, came from our operation out in Oregon uh, rule B supply uh, brought that to our attention and so we're going to start uh, adding that to our uh, catalog in manufacturing that here in North Carolina so uh, it'll be available in probably about a week um, so it's a Vivaldi board which is kind of a, a hard name but uh, that's what it is 
Um, when should you start working to control moisture in the colony? So that's a great question. So the problem uh, with moisture is uh, it's, it's not a problem as long as those bees are not clustered. And the reason for it is that the bees are able to move around, they create more air, they're able to, to create some better air currents through and exhaust that air. Also, if they're not clustered, it means that the outside temperatures are not uh, quite so cold which means that warm air that they're expelling as they're breathing, um, as it rises, it's less inclined to condense on that cold inner cover simply because it's not so cold, because the outside temperature is not so cold. So it's once the bees begin to cluster uh, and stay clustered, now we may get a cold snap that lasts for a day or two and then and then we're back up into 60s or so and the bees are sort of free to move around the colony. It's when we get that prolonged cold, they cluster and now that inner cover is chilled uh, and it condenses there or it doesn't get ventilated and they, ha they are not doing uh, a very good job of, of moving that air through the colony because they're not moving around. So time is a, a time of year you know generally we're looking at uh, October maybe into November but it's more temperature driven when those bees cluster and continuously cluster and those bees will will form a tight cluster once it starts getting down into the 40s and it's once it gets down uh, uh, into the low 40s or into the 30s that we start to see that condensation uh, begin to accumulate on, on surfaces inside the hive. Uh, let's see. So if you, uh, if, if using the split method for Varroa control, when is the latest I should make a split to ensure the queen uh, can get mated? And, oops, I just lost that question. Oh, there it is. And they can grow enough bees to over, for overwintering. So generally, what, what you're talking about is if, if you're ensuring the queen gets mated, you're talking about what's what we call a, a walkaway split. In other words, you're going to let them raise out their own queen, um, which I just sort of, as a, as a rule of thumb, use about a month for a queen to develop, go off on a mating flight, come back and begin to lay. It could be faster than that. Sometimes it can be a little longer than that. But I just use a month as a rule of thumb. And so because of that, I often don't like to do walk away splits and let them raise out queens. The other reason is we, we know that queens that are raised under emergency circumstances like that, because now they're just trying to raise out a queen because they realize they're queenless, they grab any larva of appropriate age, try and raise it out as a queen. Under those circumstances, under emergency circumstances, we know that bees, uh, the queens rather, tend to be of lower quality than queens that are, are more planned and thought out. Things, uh, queens like swarm queens or where we're actively engaged in, the, in controlling that queen rearing process, which is what commercial apiaries do. So I'm not a big fan of, of walkaway splits, but that said, um, you can overwinter nucleus hives. So as long as you can get a queen in there and get her laying and get uh, three to, f oh, let's say four frames of, of brood and bees in there, uh, you can overwinter a nucleus hive. So last winter I did this. I had three nukes that I, I, I uh, carried through uh, winter, so a five-frame nuke. They were just in their boxes by themselves. Now I had feeders on them, and I had two of the three make it, which is great because I also had some full-size colonies that did not make it. So I had these nucleus hives that I took and just threw them into those full-size colonies and off they get went. Um, so uh, you can overwinter nukes. If you're trying to get a, uh, a split into a full-size colony, you've got to really make sure that they've got adequate food reserves in there. I mean, you're looking at, uh, if you made a split now, uh, you, could, you could feed it and get it ready. Um, if you start getting into August, I get a little nervous, um, but you could probably still really push it and, and manage that colony. 
uh, in September, I, I wouldn't try it. Uh, even late August, I wouldn't try it. Um, so hopefully that, uh, that, that answers your question. Uh, let's see. Can you use the uh, wintering uh, inner cover with the Homo Soap board and still put uh, sugar candy? Yes, you can. That particular, um, I can go to that, uh, where was that? That was here. So in this case, um, you can um, you use it as a, a, a standard inner cover because the underside of this plywood has sort of just a, a quarter of an uh, inch space between the base of it and, and the box that would be below it, the brood chamber. And the homosote obviously is sitting in top here. You, if you, if you um, take this, you can uh, seal up this hole, which allows for feeder. You can actually use this as a, a, a form to pour your candy in, let it harden, then take this and flip it over so the candy's facing down and the homosote still fits in on the other side. So you can use it as a candy board with the uh, the homosote. That candy also helps a little bit with the moisture control. It helps soften the candy uh, a bit, allows those bees to cluster and actually lick up the candy and the moisture at the same time, which is which is great. Um, so it, it sort of serves a, a dual purpose. Um, so unfortunately we've uh, there's a lot more questions but we've hit the top of, of the hour, and, and I always try and um, conclude on time. For those of you that have questions that I did not answer, please reach out to us. Uh, shoot us an email. Give us a call. Use our online chat, uh, whatever is appropriate. Post something on our Facebook page. Whatever is easiest for you, we want to make sure that we get your uh, questions answered the best we possibly can. So, again, if you had a question and I didn't get to it, please reach out to us. Thanks for attending. I appreciate uh, y'all showing up this evening. I hope you found it useful. And uh, keep an eye out for future webinars. And uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.